Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic, and my guest today is Dr. Philip Jean Richard Ditt Bressel. He is a researcher who seeks to uncover the psychology and biology behind how we learn associations between cues in our environment, our behavior, and outcomes to adaptively change our behavior. Philip's main area of interest concerns how we learn which of our actions leads to bad outcomes. This is referred to as punishment learning. Understanding how we stop or fail to stop doing things that are bad for us is important to understanding and improving the choices we make in everyday lives. It is also relevant for a number of conditions characterized by dysfunctions in punishment learning, such as substance and behavioral addictions, such as drug addiction, gambling disorders, psychopathology, such as antisocial personality disorder, and depression. Philip takes us through a journey of learning about punishment learning through his research exploring neural circuitry, his work in animal models to test reward and punishment models, and in turn how they influence our decision making, and also how human research is being conducted through gamifying research protocols. Today was an absolute fascinating conversation with Philip. He's incredibly articulate and interesting in the work that he's doing and I was certainly blown away by some of the technology that he is implementing in his research and also the incredible findings that his work is bringing up, which I think has really important social uh, value to be applied if obviously people take this on board. Fantastic uh, conversation and hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Bill, a big thank you for coming on to the show today. I'm quite excited to look at, you know, one of your great interests being the space around punishment um, and in particular learning. Um, I know that you come from a psychology and biological sort of space. So I'm quite interested as I have quite an, an interest in, in uh, you know, that behavioral space as well. Uh, in many ways, I practice the applied behavioral analysis approach with children with autism uh, as, as an early uh, stage of my, my career. Uh, and so much of that was really just behaviorism. Um, and we didn't use any of the punishment learning, although I think there's a lot to be said there. And so hence, it's, it'll be interesting to uh, talk to you. So thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. Let's get started. I always start my interviews with how did you get into this space? What what what, what drew you to, to this? Why is this an interest for you? Uh, I find that the, those backgrounds are, are fascinating for me as well. Yeah. Um, so I originally, my, my background, I guess, so my undergraduate degree was in psychology. Um, and I, like so many others that start psychology, was thinking of becoming a clinical psychologist. Um, and you know, as the years, uh, you know, as I went through undergrad degree and started getting exposed to uh, the research that was being conducted at the university, um, I guess I started realizing that that might be a better fit for my personality. And so um, I eventually wound up in a behavioral neuroscience laboratory. And um, I wasn't studying the topics that I'm studying now, I was really um, studying reward learning, the neural circuitry that might be uh, doing some of those computations uh, that, you know, guide us towards reward. And then, um, so I was actually studying this uh, little brain region um, called the lateral habenula. And my, I eventually, you know, once I finished my honors year, I went on to a do a PhD and I was still, my PhD was still focused on this brain region called the lateral habenula. And it just didn't seem to be doing what everyone said it would be doing. And so I was um, kind of dancing around these hypotheses um, of what this should be involved in. And one of those things was punishment learning. And I should say that punishment learning, um, the way that I'll be referring to it um, and the way that I study it is is, uh, punishment is about how we learn association between our actions and negative consequences right so if your behavior leads to negative consequences you should be doing that behavior less um and so that was one of the things that this brain region the lateral hobenial was supposed to be important for and 
Uh, I mean, it turns out that um, when I looked at the Ladha Benila and punishment, it didn't seem to be that involved in that either. But I, you know, by embarking on that line of research and, you know, developing protocols to study punishment, um, I realized that th this was one of those things that was just not really well understood. Um, it's it's one of these fundamental learning processes um, and, you know, something that contributes to our decision making that has been totally overlooked in the literature, right? Where we've got a lot of work looking at um, Pavlovian fear um, and, and, and different types of reward learning, but that learning that an action has a negative outcome um, has been a bit of a stigmatized, right? And, and that translates to research as well. So I decided that that's something that was worth studying, that that could become something of, um, it kind of ignited a curiosity in me. And that's what eventually my PhD became that. And then now that I'm, you know, uh, starting um, my own academic, now I've become an academic and I've recently joined faculty at UNSW. Um, that's my main area of research. And we're studying that in a variety of ways, both, uh, you know, trying to understand neural circuit computation but also, you know, just on a cognitive level with humans and human decision making, how does how do we factor in this as a negative consequence? Maybe I should uh, choose not to go down this path and how that um, quite interestingly fails very often um, in our decision making. And how do you go about studying this? What are the research methods that that you're looking at? You know, how how finely into it do you go? Because obviously, mm. a hypothesis comes comes to mind. Um, you know, yeah. uh, uh, what are you working on, and how do you how do you go about testing that? I can I can imagine it's so complicated because there's so many assumptions or or uh, yeah, uh, uh, or, or controls yeah. to so, try um, and and um, create. Absolutely. Um, so I definitely have been raised in the tradition of experimental psychology where you would want to create a well-controlled uh, protocol in which you will have, you know, you know, you can make valid comparisons between um, punishment and the, the absence of punishment. Um, and in the case of when we're studying neural circuitry, um, we tend to use animal models um, because that, you know, that's the way that we can actually start manipulating and doing some really um, uh, precise measurements of what is going on in the brain. And of course, punishment learning, this ability to associate our actions with um, negative outcomes, this is evolutionarily conserved, right? We, this is not unique to humans. This is something that um, all vertebrates have and probably some invertebrates as well um because it's just so fundamental to survival and optimizing behavior um to your and adapting to your environment um so yeah we tend to use um, animal models to do the nitty-gritty neural work and but you know you get insights in, into how does how do we uh, make decisions around um these detrimental actions uh, you can study that behaviorally in animal models, but we also take this. Uh, we also do human work, where you know we tend to gamify um, a well-controlled task. And um, one of the tasks that we've developed was actually it's almost like reverse translation, where we've taken a task that's used in um, that was designed uh, for animal models, and we've taken it into humans, and we're basically showing that the decision-making processes and the way that individuals differ in the way that they approach this punishing scenario um, because people do differ immensely in how much they you know avoid a negative outcome um, that you get the exact same profiles in animals as humans um, and with humans you have this benefit of asking them why did you <laughs> why did you do that right you have you can we can kind of leverage the fact that we can talk to each other uh, um, to try and unpack some of the components of the decision-making process. Uh, and, you know, it's quite interesting to see that some the things that um, humans find kind of the cracks in our decision-making are seem to have um, carried over. It's it, maybe the... 
shared, at least across the, the animal models that we use. It's so fascinating. Happy to elaborate. <laughs> as, as a clinician, uh, for me, thinking about how conversations with my clients go is I can often observe the avoidance pattern, which I would mm -hmm. uh, relate to basically avoiding pain, discomfort, yeah. um, and any, any sense of uh, uh, negativity. But it's interesting how unreliable a client's uh, cognition of that can be, you know, or, or how they can create a narrative or a story around mm. that, that, that at least to me does not appear to be congruent with, with their behavior or, or, um, is incongruent with other narratives that they've provided. And so for me, so much of therapy is around the avoidance part of, um, you know, what I practice, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. Mm. Uh, it, it seems to be so central um and i suppose that so the idea in that therapy is to have the to build an awareness and a capacity we might call it mindfulness um to be present and observe your own cognitions and 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 then actions around for example avoidance you know whether we choose to avoid it or whether we choose to make space and room and sit in that discomfort obviously in the service of a greater good I mean, we call that a value. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit more about, you mentioned three things. One is neural circuitry. I'd love to hear more about how you do work in that. Um, yeah, obviously sure. animal models mm. uh, and then obviously the, 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 the transition to the human um, uh, model and, and gamifying some of that uh, uh, so that, you know, there are controls, but obviously there's a motivation to um, participate in that. Would that be yeah. all right if we kind of move into the, Absolutely. Uh, neural circuitry part to start with? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess, you know, we've got this wonderful organ, the brain, and not that we've got a complete handle on how it works um, because it's so wonderfully intricate and, you know, trying to map something as complicated as psychology onto something as complicated as the brain is where we're, we're still working on it. Um, but from what we do know, um, you know, the key, I guess, nucleus in the brain for punishment, or what I believe to be um, one of the kind of hubs for learning that an action has a negative outcome is the amygdala, right? Which um, most people will be familiar with because it seems to be involved in a lot of motivated processes, right? It's necessary for us to form associations between stimuli in a uh, Pavlovian sense, um, right? So our kind of, it's how we learn to fear predictors of something negative. Um, and that seem, that ability to predict something negative also seems to apply to our own behavior, right? So how our behavior leads to something negative. You get these, um, if, you, if you remove the amygdala, you really impair the ability to, um, avoid or stop doing things that have negative consequences. Um, and so, you, you know, there's amygdala dysfunction has been Im implicated in uh, your disorders that seem to have an impairment in that avoidance. So let's say psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder is characterized by, um, you know, just doing things that have negative consequences and, and, and you know, let's say um, criminality and recidivism is is associated with dysfunctions in the amygdala as well. Um, so, in terms of what is going on in the amygdala, uh, well, we're some of the work that we've done has shown that um, the amygdala, as a as a brain region, is in, is very responsive to outcomes. Right. So you've got different um, types of cells in the amygdala. Some of them are responding to rewards. Right. So you get these transient increases whenever um, this organism, this applies to humans and, and animals, um, you will, it seems to be encoding um, appetitive events. And then there are other 
uh, populations of neurons in the amygdala that are uh, encoding negative events. And uh, I guess if you really want to get into it, they seem to be encoding specific outcomes, right? So if this particular bad thing happens, the amygdala is important for representing that specific negative outcome. And one of the things that happens in the amygdala as a behavior gets associated with those negative outcomes is that that behavior starts to elicit the represent, well, it starts to elicit the same pattern of activity in the neurons that are predicting that outcome, right? So it's almost like those neurons are being triggered. It's um, almost um, bringing up the thought of that negative outcome as you're doing that action. Um, just, just to jump in, sorry, Phil, yeah, uh, no, that's so right. I can get my head around it. Yeah. So there are, there are neurons that are responsible for the actual fear response itself, but there's also predictive neurons that are anticipating, or at least circuitry that's anticipating. And, and, and they're obviously somewhat, is, is how I'm understanding it, they're, they're separate, but they're obviously clearly connected because you kind of do need predictive ones to be telling the, um, uh, the actual uh, uh, fear response to, to fire because that's what will then force the function of action, mm -hmm. i.e. avoidance. I, so this is, um, this is where there will be some debate okay. over what um, amygdala neurons are actually doing. Are they responsible for the behavioral response um, or they might be more of a precursor to that? So one thing that, um, you know, we're still... I'll give my what I think might be going on, and um, while putting a big asterisk on there, saying sure, that sure. Um, neuroscientists um, it, are still debating how the amygdala is responsible for changing behavior in these, you know, motivationally significant ways. And uh, I would say that one thing we can agree on is that. Um, the amygdala, particularly the basolateral part of the amygdala, is um, you've got populations of neurons that seem to respond to reward, and then there are populations of neurons that seem to respond to uh, negative events, right? And and how fine grained those um, that becomes. So let's say if it's an aversive event, like. A particular type of pain versus another type of pain versus hot, cold, or even just a predictor of something negative. Um, those neurons seem to kind of fire together, whereas the other population of neurons seem to fire to reward and are actually inhibited by negative events. Um, and what happens is those neurons, that firing pattern seems to be evoked as um, a predictor is, once you've learned a prediction of those events, those neurons are being almost engaged in the same way as if that outcome was happening or to okay. some extent. Yeah. So it's, if you, uh, the way I think about it, and, and again, this is up for debate, but the way I think about it is that the amygdala is representing the outcomes the things that we care about. And if, and one of the things that's happening in the amygdala, this neuroplasticity is that as you learn the association between things, the amygdala is being used to evoke that representation or that idea of that outcome when the predictor is happening, right? Otherwise okay. imagine that you've got, you know, a cue, let's say a light and, that light reliably predicts some negative event, the only way that you are particularly, you know, when that light happens, your ability to go, oh, that negative event, that particular type of pain is coming. The amygdala is the thing that's basically alerting you to sure. that thing that hasn't happened yet. Um, is that kind of, there's an the evolutionary thing. advantage. For example, uh, as a very young child mm -hmm. sees, for example, a flame, a fire, they have no representation of what that means. So mm -hmm. they're in a neutral state. The amygdala is very happy. Mm -hmm. um, they put their hand into the fire and they get a burn. 
and and obviously the amygdala fires up and and recognizes that's pain um that is a negative event yeah uh, and it associates now the visual of flame as being dangerous um and so when it's re-exposed in the future uh it will uh i suppose be in theory um much more cautious uh, mm -hmm. and, and for prevent it, it itself from putting their hand in yeah uh, obviously as we do as parents we will associate that with the word fire or mm -hmm. flame or ouchy yeah uh, and, and we'll try and put as many connections as we can mm -hmm. around that um yeah and so there's that association so the idea there is a certain level of caution will will occur or let's call it a, a arousal um that that's uncomfortable yeah. so that it prevents the child from doing that again and that and that's across the board uh yeah. the the important thing here at least for me <clears throat> is to understand that the same circuitry is firing whether it's anticipating or whether it's occurring and that's the pre preventative mechanism of saying avoid 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 yeah or at least be cautious because this is of a concern there's a negative outcome attached to it absolutely yeah so that definitely seems to be going on of course the amygdala is not an island it's you know connected and there yes. the, it's not like we um i mean the degree to which the amygdala is engaged is implicated in how real that you know or how present that outcome feels right and so this is one of those um, so let's say in, um, this is not my area of expertise per se, but um, in post-traumatic stress disorder, there's, um, you know, there's evidence to suggest there's an overactivation of the amygdala, right? That makes, cool. you know, a, as you know, you have this, you can have this initially traumatic event and then there are the, the cues and the, you know, actions and things that are become immediately associated with that initial negative event, but that can um extend outwards right you start getting associations you know the cues of those key, initial cues and cues for those cues and so it just builds outwards until it kind of you know before someone's kind of pushed into a corner painted into a corner if you will mm. um for things to be afraid of um and you know where they're like i don't want to leave the house because you know all these sights and sounds uh evoke kind of these negative feelings in me um, and, you know, there's a point at which that adaptive, the adaptive learning becomes maladaptive, sure. um, but that that's associated with, uh, increased amygdala engagement such, such that, you know, you can't tell the difference or, or you become kind of distanced from what actually happened and how specific that event was, uh, versus, you know, the potential for that thing to happen. Right. Bill, I'd like to get your take on something because this is just kind of jumped to mind. Yeah. I thought I might might share it because I like like doing it in this way. I wonder if there's a possibility, and obviously we're speculating here, mm. that the amygdala is somewhat uh, reasonably associated with the limbic system, so that it, it produces a visceral response. You know, and and, and obviously we have cognitions and i think we're uh relatively comfortable and please you know you correct me wherever i'm wrong here we're relatively comfortable with with uh at least where our yeah prefrontal cortex executive executive functioning comes from to a degree there's everything is connected understanding that but uh that there's a limbic system response which is kind of the the feelings the emotions that mm. uh, uh drive us and then and then there is a uh, a cognition that goes over the top of that and potentially those two that, that 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 might be responsible for what i'm seeing in therapy where a client says i'm doing this because of x which mm. is the cognition mm. but we know there's an avoidance going on which is a limbic avoidance uh but the necessary the, the cognition doesn't necessarily even get it you know i mean quite often we don't understand why we're doing something but yeah. we're doing it because we, there's an internal driver mm. called discomfort. Now, I don't know how to describe that. It's discomfort, it's agitation, it's arousal, it's yeah. 
it's uh, 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 you know uh, some type of uh, 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 it's kind of almost like not intense sorry it's not even physical uh yeah. it's emotional you know there's yeah. there's yeah. Un, uh, there's unrest and yeah. we're trying to get back to equilibrium and so we avoid that thing that, that that's mm. great unrest which is a limbic response yeah yeah this is um this is a really interesting um i guess topic um this kind of becomes almost the we're kind of delving into some of the philosophy of psychology and and some of the <laughs> um because there definitely have been movements um, and and schools of thought around how we've got kind of these bottom up, uh, visceral, limbic, re like reptile parts of our brain, and they kind of collide with, or are there's going to be the somewhere in the brain that this the divergence between all these feelings that we don't necessarily have declarative knowledge of, right? It just uh, they're kind of setting the palette, the tone and the color of, of, of our thinking. But, you know, we have these explicit, um, verbal cognitive parts that come in and, and somehow those two things come together. I'm not, I don't have a strong, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that, um, that could be part of it. And there's definitely um, reason to think that our brain is kind of like this ag agglomeration of different processes that are kind of independent from each other, right? But at the same time, the brain is this wonderfully interconnected thing. There, oh, the, I see. The, the brain is kind of a, it's, it's constantly integrating information. That's, that's, probably why the brain's architecture is so intricate is that it's on one hand, you have um, very dedicated sensory and kind of hardwired circuits for a, just helping you uh, take in information from your world. And then it, but it's integrating um, and processing that information from the earliest stages. And then once you really get into the, you know, the deep parts of the brain where you start getting very elaborate, very abstract um, processing like emotion, right? So emotion is a highly abstracted and elaborate, elaborated process, but it's very hardwired as well. Right. And we don't necessarily have a way of, um, we, we, I feel like people have differing levels of, um, I guess, explicit access to their emotions, right? I mean, you're great. Some people are, are very, very sensitive and very good at expressing what they're feeling and others maybe less so. And so, you know, they, in the same way that someone can, um, you know, be very frustrated with their day and, you know, take it out on someone else um, without realizing Oh, I just I just had a bad day, and the appropriate thing for me is to just cool off for a bit, and then mm. um, you know move on um, instead of letting these emotions kind of uh, be in the driver's seat without us even realizing yeah. that they are. It seems to me, Phil, that that that, and I'm talking, in, I suppose, in line with the ACT model, acceptance and mm. therapy model, that in the center of of the model, the, the the middle section is where the space of, if I can just call it awareness, you know, being being present, mindfulness, um, and that that in some sense modulates the the clash, so to speak, between you know the the limbic and the cognitive uh, worlds, and so if the mm -hmm. observer the, the the awareness can be increased. It will feel the limbic effect, but it won't judge it, and so it won't try and run away from it. It won't mm. try and and uh, uh, you know in, avoid it impulsively. For example, mm. if it can see and be aware of the cognitions, it won't judge those and take them on as being valid either. It, it will. Uh, uh, be more mindful to observe them 
and from that position, I suppose, modulate or moderate the the intensity because um, yeah. it's not afraid of those. Yeah. And from that position, then go, what are my values and what's the behaviors I'll then select, mm -hmm. you know, and, and choose. And obviously, all of those things and the actor model actually demonstrates that all of these functions are a process. It, they, then they look like they're uh, uh, core sections or separate sections. But in actual fact, there, there's these particular um, connecting lines in the model mm. that show that this is a uh, process-based therapy. Um, and all of those things are being activated and, and work in unison. Mm. Uh, and there's this kind of awareness in the, in the in the center. And the idea around that is psychological flexibility to yeah. observe, to notice, and obviously yeah. then have wider um, selection. So it kind of says, can I observe my neural circuitry so to speak in, in 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 somewhat real time or even predict how it will fire because i know myself well yeah i know that i will get agitated yeah with this cue um yeah uh, and then kind of observe that to you know flex that observational non-judgmental muscle so i don't uh, i'll still feel the fear or mm. the arousal but i can then moderated and not run away or yeah you know, i don't know let the, yeah no there's there's i mean that's that's the interesting thing about the brain is that it can think about itself and <laughs> um you know yeah. and and we can think about our thought process um it, there's you know this it's very meta and um i you know this is where obviously the the our access to the brain through animal models and then this ability to track these more abstracted processes is that, you know, that's where it gets tricky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's very hard to study how um, something like a thought changes the brain and what the relationship between those two things are. Like how does the brain changes itself, right? I mean, the, 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 the act of thinking is a process of the brain and yet thinking does seem to change it is a process like thinking changes the way that we think um, the way that we process and contextualize our own experience is fundamental to the way that, you know, in the next moment, how do we, how do we think about that? How do we feel about, um, uh, you know, our experiences, all of that comes from whether we've been, we've given ourselves a chance to process the initial experience in the first place, right? And that's why therapy is is so important. I mean, talk mm. therapy. Um, yeah. It's, it's Bill, it, to think about these things. Yeah, yeah. I, I keep going probably a little bit meta because that's how my mind works. So I hijack that I a little bit. But finish up if you don't mind on the neural circuitry and then we can move across to the to the animal models because I'm super interested in finding out uh you know your work and, and and what models are being you know used and and how do we learn in that space? What what are we what are doing? What's the research? Sure. Um, so I mean, the amygdala, as I said, was is not an island. It's it's uh, connected with the prefrontal cortex and um, you know the parts of the brain that seem to be more responsible for deciding uh, which action to take. And so you know it's sending out these. Um, it's sending out these projections or these connections to these other parts. And see, let's say if the amygdala is important for that representation, it is kind of communicating that that outcome or even that outcome that may happen should you go down this path to these other brain regions that seem to be communicating. And then, of course, the amygdala is receiving a ton of input. So the amygdala, I, I see the amygdala as this hub that's receiving inputs from all sorts of places, but there's all these other parallel circuits that we study, including, you know, how dopamine and how serotonin um, are being, uh, I guess, broadcast. You've got these serotonin-based signals and these dopamine-based signals that are being broadcast to other parts of the brain, but also to the amygdala. Um, and, you know, we're still working on that story on how those how real-time dopamine release and serotonin release in particular parts of the brain are building up this computation and allowing you to learn 
that this action leads to that bad outcome, this action does not. And actually that, you know, let's say drugs that are increasing or decreasing that um, ability to avoid that negative outcome seems to be affecting the way that that coding is happening in the amygdala, but also in other parts of the brain. So we're still working on on what's going on in real time, right? You know, my my original research was really about, okay, if we up or down regulate the activity in this part of the brain as a whole, right, without any specificity in to specific neural circuits, you know, it's like this, this affects punishment in this way versus not, right? So sometimes it'll affect the initial decision to make the response. Sometimes it will affect when you make that response and the negative outcome happens, that's a learning event, right? Um, in some cases, it, or even a relearning event. It's like, oh yeah, this leads to that negative outcome. But if you have, um, you know, if you're manipulating the parameters of the brain through some drug, let's say an anxiolytic like benzodiazepines, um, you're changing the way that that event gets processed, right? The parameters of your brain have changed and therefore the decision-making process changes or even the learning process changes. And you might go, that wasn't so bad. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to actually do more of this action because it's associated with the reward as well. So yeah, it's um, that's one line of research is really just understanding, okay, how how does learning and decision-making happen in, in brain circuits? But one of the areas that we're kind of getting into, and this will segue into our human decision-making, um, is how individuals vary from that, right? So, you know, you can sure. present individuals with the exact same punishing scenario. This action leads to a negative event. This action does not lead to a negative event. You know, what are your levels of responding on those two things? How does that change as this negative event gets introduced? Um, that exact same scenario, you get drastically different responses across individuals to that exact same scenario. So um, can I, can yeah. I just jump in and ask a, a question? I've I've seen images, uh, and I can't validate whether they're, they're uh, true or not. But I thought mm -hmm. I'd ask uh, uh, you, yourself of pictures of of neural clusters, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, that uh, depicted um, an association or a pathway that is. I suppose very low. It's not something that is of importance. It hasn't been used very much. Uh, and then a neural cluster, I suppose, that's highly associated with, you know, um, let, let, let's say a fear response. Um, yeah. And the two images uh, or, or depictions or photographs even um, have kind of showed that one is much more advanced and integrated and has a whole lot of neural connections attached to it. So it, it looks like it's thicker, so to speak. So mm -hmm. um, it's almost like having a a wire with more strands in it. So it's a yeah. thicker wire. Um, that would be a poor representation. It looks much more sketchy than that. And like a, a regular one um, is is, is not so. And, you know, the Theory behind it is if, uh, if if there's a stronger association, there's more neural networks and that that could even physically be observable. Is that valid? Is that true? Do we have science around that? Uh, or is this just a bit of nonsense that, you know, looks really good in um, in, in, in pictures and articles and, and, and the like? And that doesn't necessarily mean that that might not still be the current understanding of, you know, there's more associations that are built around something like in PTSD, there are more cues, mm. the greater neural net that connects all of those versus if the accident didn't happen or the, 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 the incident didn't yeah. happen. But is this observable uh, uh, before we kind of move on? I would say that, yes, it is observable. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, now that our, neuroscience technology is where we're kind of in a golden age of neuroscience actually because the technology you know that we're using we have you know an, so much more capacity to actually look into the brain in real time like while um granted most of this work needs to be done in animals because you can't you know <laughs> we can't muck around with a human brain 
um, the way that, um, you know, with proper ethical procedures, sure. <laughs> you know, applying proper ethical approaches, um, you can really get into the, the, the weeds of how the brain is doing things in real time. There is some evidence to show that as something is being learned. Of course, the brain is, you know, we talk we talk about computations and circuitry, like it's something that's very hardwired, but the brain is a biological thing. It's it's growing, it's developing, it's adapting. And the adaptability of the brain um, is, is, you know, was once underappreciated. And now we're very much aware that the brain is incredibly dynamic. Even the, ver the mere uh, recollection of a memory is involving all these, um, you know, is, is a is a very real biological process in the brain. And as something is being learned, and the degree to which something is learned seems to be um, there, there's some evidence what it means, like whether it's about how thick a you know a cluster of neurons gets wired. Um, I I won't say anything about that, but there is something. There, there is some merit to the idea, or at least there's some evidence to support this idea that as something is being learned about, those, you know, neuro, like more neurons are being recruited to handle this learning as in, and, and the brain is constantly doing this, right? And in the same way that if, if something becomes um, irrelevant let's say uh, this this is this is more rewiring so let's say if you've got uh if you lose a sense or if you are an amputee right your brain just re it's not being used to represent your hand anymore it gets um redistributed right those neurons get redistributed to handle the computations associated with feeling in your elbow right if if you're if you've been amputated just below the elbow um and that's kind of a fundamental process that also happens for things like learning, right? In a sense, if um, if you're learning associations, if there's a, something really important for you to learn, your brain is essentially rewiring itself to, I guess, take on these new associations. Um, the degree to which you get that new recruitment is the degree to which you're going to see these changes in behavior, these changes in cognitions and emotions um, that are needed, or or your brain has decided to you know invest um, into making those changes. So yeah, I would say that it is quite a physical thing, and you you can see this in the brain. I'm not sure what image uh, you're referring to, and there is a lot of science out there that. Um, looks a lot cooler than it is, provides insight <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately um but yeah it, you know it is nice to actually you know, as scientists we want to we want to observe you know we don't want to just theorize we actually want if we're if we're saying that something is physically happening in the brain it's really nice when you can physically see that thing happening um, yeah, now we have yeah. the technology to do that and there are images coming out and and some of our own work um, I'm still analyzing this data actually of let's say those amygdala we I seem I see um as an animal is going from a rewarding situation to one that is you know has mixed rewards and punishment. Um there I see a little bit of evidence that more and more neurons in the amygdala are being recruited into representing the aversive outcome, right? This punishing outcome. And in turn, those neurons are being used to, you know, whenever the animal is making a punished action, those neurons are being recruited to represent the negativity of that action or the, the negative outcome associated with that action. So you're getting this, you know, <clears throat> in a sense, uh, a shift in the, in the amygdala of this is this is what's important now. This is what you need to learn about. And you've got, in a sense, physical resources, those neurons being committed to that process. And of course, there's um, all these process, these changes happening within a neuron as well, right? You get um, the neurons talk to each other through synapses, um, right? So the these are the connections that release the chemicals, the communication chemicals between neurons, and you get... Um, increased or a change in how 
many synapses a neuron has and, and how many connections it's having with another um, neuron, the efficiency of those synapses. There's so many changes. This is where the brain gets, you know, it's turtles all the way down, it's just a fractal of, 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 of changes that are happening. So it's, we're, we're still figuring it out. Um, and can you talk me through that a little bit more? Obviously there's, there's more of a distribution model rather than a, you know, a, a pruning model and 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 that's mm. that kind of neuroplasticity um understanding you spoke about some research around the animal um uh, uh research with mixed rewards and and and, and punishments mm. what does the actual research look like um in terms of how you're doing rewards how you're doing punishments and, and then how you're yeah. measuring you know for example um increased synapses or uh, uh, uh you know connections to to see that um redistribution occurring that, that sounds so fascinating well there's um so usually we'll so with these really um i guess when you're getting into the intricacy of the brain um there are different technologies that give you that in a sense different tools to answer different questions so some of the tools that uh, we're using um are we, we make use of these uh, fluorescent indicators. So the, what we call biosensors that we can, you know, express in select neurons. Um, so we, these things basically glow according to uh, whether, so these are um, genetically engineered um, proteins that we've allowed cells to express in these neurons and they give us um, kind of like a real-time readout of some kind of thing, whatever that biosensor is designed to detect. So uh, one of the, the most commonly used one is a biosensor for uh, calcium. And that lets you see uh, calcium is one of the, I guess, the molecules that fluctuates with neural activity. It's present in the synapse. And so when you're if you zoom in, if you have a, a tool that allows you to really look, zoom in on a on individual synapses. So this is one of those uh, technologies is two photon calcium imaging. Um, you can actually see those synapses, um, you know, forming. You can see them working in real time when those synapses are actually releasing chemicals. That's not. I don't use two photon calcium imaging, but we do use. Uh, those biosensors and we look at a population as a whole. So we basically have a, a lens and a microscope and we get to look at those neurons um, while an animal is doing a task. And so in terms of answering the question of what rewards, um, so different just, programs. Just quickly, Phil, before you jump in, is the biosensor uh, a technology that doesn't require you to add anything to the subject? Uh, it actually just binds that protein or can can observe that protein or is it kind of like when you go to a ct scan and they inject you with some sort of dye and and then the the biosensor picks up the dye is is it uh uh no it's not or it's, neither of the above <laughs> um so usually what we'll have to do so these you know these are not naturally occurring but uh, those biosensors are not naturally occurring but they are based on their their they are proteins and so we can get the genetic code we we've created genetic code for these things and if you put it in a in a human or any you know any living organism it's and and you give it uh you know you put it in front of the cellular mach machinery that reads off this genetic code and produces proteins that cell is just going to make this stuff for you so we tend to introduce we we have these like non-pathogenic viruses. So the most commonly used one is an adeno associated virus, right? So it's kind of associated with, um, it's like the, the virus that carries the cold, except we've made it so that instead of um, it containing code for itself, right? So viruses just contain their own code, get into your cells and force your cells to make more of the virus. What we've done is we've basically taken out all that, you know, the, adeno associated virus code and instead we've put in the code that we want the cell to produce that is the code for the biosensor you can 
um, exposed neurons to this virus. The virus is going to get that genetic code into the cells. That virus dies off within, you know, within a day. And now all these cells, and these can be, you can really target which kinds of cells you want to express. Um, and this is where I'm saying we're in a kind of neuroscience revolution. These tools wow. are very new um, where we can actually select specific circuits, right? Before we had no access, we knew that the brain was this complicated circuitry, but we had no way of actually, let's say, targeting a biosensor to a specific circuit. I want the neurons of this particular cell type that projects to this particular region. Now we can actually go, let's express the biosensor in those specific cells um, through you know, these viral mediated approaches. And those cells are going to produce this biosensor. Once that genetic code's in there, it will slowly express this biosensor. And of course, um, you know, we choose viruses and we choose um, genetic tools that are really well tolerated by those cells. So those cells are alongside, you know, making the proteins that they make to do their thing, right? To act as a neuron. Sure. It's also making these biosensors, which are basically making these cells glow um, as um, as they're doing their thing. And so we can get a readout of, let's say, how much dopamine is being released onto this neuron, how much serotonin is being released onto it. Um, you know, how, what is through the calcium um, readout, we can get an idea of what is the neural activity pattern of this cell. All wow. sorts of, this, um, this, this completely blows my mind. Um, it, it, it is, is phenomenal. At, at, you know, in, in some sense, the, how, incredible the microscope has become you know the, mm. the fact that we can have these you know uh, uh biosensors to to go out and look at it at that level is 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 phenomenal um, yeah. and then you can do this in real time yeah what, what what what's the experimental method you were just about to to, to uh, talk about what you're introducing um, yeah. or removing um as part of the research or part of the method well, the behavioral, so I was going to talk about the behavioral protocol that we use. And so we tend to work um, in rodents so that the, I can talk about the the overall like schematic of, a, of an experiment, but the particular behavioral protocol that we tend to use and everyone, I mean, different people use different protocols to get it different. Um, even those who are studying punishment, they will use uh, different protocols to look at particular things. My, I'm particularly just interested in how do you learn to associate an action with a negative outcome? And once you've learned that, how do you make decisions around making that particular action? And I tend to have rodents uh, pressing levers for a uh, food reward. Mm -hmm. And then the um, aversive event. So, you know, we'll train, um, you know, we, we let these animals, we put them into these chambers that have these retractable levers and you know a port where food gets delivered and they're pressing away on these on these levers and then you know once rats will quite readily learn to do that right they're 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 quite intelligent animals and as you um we move on to the next phase on one of those responses we are they, they will still yield reward but we will also um as they make that response, if they make that response, a um, they're basically on this grid, and we will, for half a second, um, you know, deliver a a mild foot shock, if they make the response. So that's the the learning between if I make this response, there's this aversive stimulus, and of course it's very mild, but it's it's and 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 it's not anything that can actually. Uh, do any harm to the animal, but it is an unpleasant event. And um, in that scenario, most animals will rapidly stop making response to that lever, and they will instead focus their efforts on the response that's completely safe, right? So you get, sure. that's where we have access to, okay, there's this response that is increasingly avoided because it has this negative event. And of course, if the animal avoids, if the animal stops making that response, they will not get any aversive events. But usually there's going to be, like humans, a certain level of risk-taking and 
um, tolerance for it. You know, it's like you're you're kind of going, I'm going to do that less. I'm not going to stop altogether, but I'll do that less um, because I don't, you know, I don't like it very much. Sure. Um, and, yeah. and the lever that produces the unpleasant event, mm -hmm. that is not uh, on every event of the lever. It is, I'm assumed, a variable punishment um yes. yeah so, uh, it's, so it's only a su it's only a subset of the responses <clears throat> and, yeah. and uh yeah in fact like the vast minority of the responses are going to produce that aversive event yeah so in in effect it's it, it's kind of like that scenario of uh two levers or two decks of cards one's a one's a winner every single time yeah and and one is a winner uh 90 percent of the time uh but 10% of the time I'll, I'll have an unpleasant event and, 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 you know, how long does it take to learn that, but it doesn't mean that you learn it completely because you're still being rewarded there. There's mm -hmm. just a mild punishment. Obviously yeah. if the punishment was great, mm -hmm. um, they'd learn that just don't go to that lever. You're still yeah. getting rewarded over here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, kind of like that. So I would say it's both of them are on lean schedules, right? So because we're interested in looking at when they make the response without any outcomes, you know, what, how does that get processed as well? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, you know, think of it as there's, you know, a 10% chance of getting a reward. And so you're making, you know, there's no real cost to making a response with no outcomes. So that's sure. kind of just in the background, but you're not getting rewarded every single time. You're getting rewarded every now and then. And then for that specific lever, you're also on an independent schedule. So we don't deliver our reward and our punishment at the same time. Um, some people do, um, but that complicates it, right? Because you start getting kind of ca counter conditioning, right? Where you, on a, in a sense, the, the reward can condition the the shock, you know, so that makes it less aversive. Well, we're interested in how animals process those two different outcomes, right? So mm, we're you're trying to control for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, so we, you know, 10% of the time they they can get reward. Let's say it's not, it's not 10%, whereas the shock is 10%. Um, so 10% of the time they will um receive that foot shock and on a completely separate schedule they will receive rewards for that same response um but you know the animals in that 10 percent scenario where it's very um that's something that um animals uh learn really well right they're especially when they're all when they only have access to that if they only have access to that one lever they're very aware that this is the response that has this negative outcome and so they are really going to hold back on on that response depending on how um you know how aversive they find that that event and that's something else that we really want to try and understand is not just the neural circuitry but the psychology of it as well because there's different uh components to that decision making process right so you've got sure. <clears throat> on one hand the reward like why would they make the response in the first place it's like well there's a reward associated so there's appetitive motivation that's driving them to make that response but at the same time there's the aversive motivation that go that disincent disincentivizes that response and then there's also all the learning like how what kind of associations have they formed that kind of um mediates the you know how those motivations the appetitive aversive motivations get reconciled to guide behavior sure sure and you know uh, all of this has to be so well controlled to Absolutely. actually understand it because obviously if, <clears throat> if a uh, uh, a rat is um uh, has a, a a increased appetite because it's been um starved for a longer period mm -hmm. of time then obviously the the perceived reward is much greater and, and, and yeah. the perceived punishment is much lower yeah. um and so that changes so having these these very specific controls yeah means that you can look at the circuitry properly um yeah. against all other controls and, and get an understanding at least with um with those parameters and and obviously yeah. we learn from that and extrapolate so yeah uh, it's it's a collaborative process and and again the all of that so let's say you know how we keep animals motivated and things like that. All of that is, you know, there's there's a 
in a sense a complicated um uh ethics the the oh, I'm sure. are, are all all of that kind of uh underpins everything that we do and so you know we there, there's a process and that that we need to abide by and of course it's a collaborative process of of going here's here's a well controlled design and then of course there's um you, they'll go well can we study this in um in a more effective and 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 um in as humane way as possible and then of course it kind yes. of goes from there and so all yeah. of these things get built out out of there so with a with an eye on how much information we can get from these protocols as well as um you know whether there's a more efficient um yeah and better ways to do it so yeah we've kind of gotten to this point through that process <clears throat> and phil what are some of the interesting findings that we've seen from these animal models uh before we kind of push across to the the, the human um uh, gamified um approaches what what have we found what have you been able to observe what what does the literature say uh, as well that uh, i suppose has jumped out at you um, what's what's gotten you you know interested in this is is more often than not sure. things that are like whoa this is incredible yeah so okay one of the things with an eye of segueing into the human work um so i mean we've talked a little bit about the neural circuitry and 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 that stuff's really fun it's very complex and difficult to do work uh, especially on the analysis side of things um but one of the things that still um, you know, fascinates us is um, more on the psychological front of how those, you know, this, you you put an animal, and that includes humans into an environment, we will quickly adapt to it. We have all this um, neural machinery, this architecture to handle, you know, building these associations between the cues in the environment, how our actions relate to those cues and those outcomes. And uh, one of the interesting things, uh, so using one of, um, you know, an older protocol, one that I kind of inherited from um, a more senior researcher at UNSW, um, is, you know, you can put an animal in a kind of a choice situation where they have access to those two levers and those levers deliver rewards, but you can later um, make those levers deliver a cue and that cue is associated with an either an aversive event or a neutral event right and so you've got this response cue outcome um, association that can be formed and so there what's really uh kind of neat about this design is that it helps you unpack what the animal might be learning right so they can learn about you can measure how much aversion they have to that outcome through what they're learning about the cue. But you can also measure how their decision-making and what they're learning about their own actions based on how you know they're changing their behavior between the response that leads to that aversive cue versus the neutral cue. Um, and when you put uh, an animal in that scenario, and indeed, if you put animals in, in almost any punishing scenario, you, um, you get these um, bimodal distributions. So as you, you know, as you and, and your audience probably know, most things are unimodally distributed, right? You, whether you're measuring something biological like height or, but behavior too, right? Like we are on a spectrum. Every, there's, there's variability. People differ. Um, and, but you get these unusual situations where you don't have this uniform distribution. Instead, you have, or rather, uh, not uniform, a, a Gaussian distribution. You have these scenarios, and punishment is one of these things where if you give um, a population of animals or humans a punishing scenario, you get a bimodal distribution of those that will completely avoid punishment and those that will persist will just basically it's almost ignore it, right? instead of having this unimodal distribution that has been i mean that's fascinating because on one hand punishment is this evolutionarily conserved process right it's so fundamental um and it's so simple 
action leads to bad thing, stop doing that thing. And yet you can, even though we all have, um, you know, we, we all have brains that should be able to process and, and, and come to that conclusion, you get, you don't see this more normal type of variability. You get, um, in a sense, clustering, right? So mm -hmm. those that are punishment sensitive versus insensitive. And that's been observed for, um, you know, there's been sprinkles and anecdotes that punishment is one of these processes that seems to fall through the cracks, right? You know, reward learning is really robust um, and Pavlovian fear is quite robust that it tends to be this, you know, it just happens, right? It's this really reliable process. When it comes to punishment, for whatever reason, reasons that we're still trying to figure out, is that it's not as reliable, that this mm. is, you know, this is the quadrant in association learning that seems to be um, the least reliable. And that's probably why it gets, um, why it's been somewhat stigmatized in research, right? That they're, they're like, well, something funny is going on with punishment. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't seem to work. Maybe it's not worth studying. Um, but I would make the argument that it's absolutely worth studying. And, and for that reason, especially, right, that there, this seems to be a, an anomaly, a psychological anomaly. Um, and through that task that I mentioned, we are actually able to start unpacking why punishment doesn't seem to be working in some individuals. It, it, it almost poses the question of you know, having this bimodal um, outcome uh, uh somewhat potentially um uh, uh hypothesizes that there's two outcomes uh, uh and one outcome being for example a punishment and the other one potentially being a reward mm -hmm. um uh, and I, I say this in, in a classic sort of scenario where most people um to the queue of uh, illicit drugs mm -hmm. um the outcome is I'm going to avoid it. Yeah. And and so they see that as it's a punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, the person who sees the cue of illicit drugs as I'm going to not avoid it, I'm going to use it, uh, they actually see the cue as being a reward. Mm -hmm. They're measuring a different thing. They're not measuring will it damage my social relationships or yeah. my capacity to get to work tomorrow. Yeah, They're measuring what will it provide me now? Yeah. Uh, as with someone else is saying, saying, what will it provide me tomorrow? Yeah. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, in your research, you can try and uh, control for all of this, but in human variability, a classic one is, is saying, let's just punish people for going out and using drugs. Mm. Um, when in actual fact, uh, uh, it doesn't work that way because potentially the way that they are perceiving um, uh, or even potentially, you know, if I use the the, the, the clumsy word uh, wired, um, is that they look for what's interesting now, what is rewarding now rather than what is rewarding later. So delayed gratification versus yeah. instant gratification. Um, and I'm sure there's plenty of research out there do doing that, but it sounds like that bimodal is is at least from a me me bring it into the uh, the therapy uh, room again. Uh, uh, it, it's it's potentially showing how how's the human associating them rather than us deciding that illicit drugs is bad. You know, um, yeah. not quite. They might be viewing it differently, and that could be avoidance of other emotions. You know, if I take this drug, it removes other pains you know my my um and we do it as well you know when when mm. i'm watching television uh it's not interesting enough so to avoid the boredom i will grab some nuts or some snacks yeah. um and so that's a very mild uh discomfort but i still avoid it and i grab the chips yeah um so we definitely do think of this we, we definitely have, um, you know, we take these findings, especially on punishment, the, it is definitely 
uh, relevant to addiction. That's that's something we are, uh, you know, okay. we have a strong opinion of that. Granted, we haven't studied it in that context, but um, you know, we have been, we do a little bit of addiction research, and uh, the addiction scientists, you know, I've, I, they've asked me to present these non-drug findings to them because they they're like this is exactly what we think might be going on in addiction, um, where there's a very different, um, I guess, appraisal of, you know, there's a complete discounting of the negative consequences of action. That's one of the characteristic definitions of of addiction, right? That um, you are drug seeking and taking despite profound negative consequences, um, whether it's to your health or, um, you know, the, the risk of, you know, being incarcerated on all the things, um, you know, or let's say loss of jobs and, and, and a breakdown of your social, you know, of your social network, which, you know, does, as you, you know, go down the path of more and, you know, more and more severe substance abuse, that's, that's kind of where everything winds up. So yeah, where we definitely we definitely want to look into that more. And again, we take this into the laboratory setting to try to understand or unpack the normal mechanisms of learning. And, you know, even in a non-drug setting, even without substances, and this is not surprising because addictions, as you kind of allude to, come in many forms, right? As in substances aren't the only thing that people can get addicted to. Um, You know, gambling and whatnot is another one where, you know, despite severe negative, you know, this, this negative prognosis for this behavior, and even experience with, you know, it's like, you're losing, you know, you're losing your all the money in your wallet, and then your bank account, you mortgaging your house just to, um, to continue this habit, right? It's, it's, it it gets very dark. Um, with no substances involved at all. Um, so- and interesting, we would see this in a- athletes where yeah. they are overtraining. Right. Uh, when everyone, you know, trainers and the like are saying, you've got to pull back and, and yeah. like, no, I've got to do this. So it happens even in things that objectively others would, would, sorry, subjectively others would say, you know, in the most regular time, exercise is good. At the moment, it's flipped. It's not because you're injured. You need to stop. Yeah, someone can't stop themselves. They're they're they're, they're too um, rewarded, excited by yeah. the prospect of of you know continuing to exercise or whatever it might be. Yeah. Sorry, interrupt. Yeah. Um, right. That's that's a really interesting um, example. So, I mean, when when it comes to you know, as a person who's interested in how we process and change our behavior according to you know, negative consequences. Um, you know, we were interested in that process, um, you know, outside the drug setting and basically saying, well, there's different components to the decision-making process as well as the learning processes that might steer one person down, you know, this adaptive cessation of a detrimental action. Whereas you, you know, what we're trying to understand is why would someone continue to do something that has, you know, these really profound negative consequences. Um, And we're trying to tease apart, you know, it's, it can be difficult to disentangle. um, You know, it's like, it's because they're overly motivated for the reward associated with that thing. Or in the case of, let's say, you know, those athletes, it's like they, you know, maybe they're like, no, I need my gains, right. As in, I need to, I need to stay at the top of the game. So I need to keep training. The training is the way that I, I do that versus maybe they're not uh, that sensitive to that aversive consequence, right? They just don't care. So some people um, kind of, let's say with um, another instance of, of persistent detrimental behavior in those with conduct disorders, right? They might go, um, this individual just does not care about this the negative consequences right it has it's not even being perceived by them it what we need is a harsher let's say with um drug taking right they're like clearly these people are not responding to um uh fines we need to you know we need a bigger hammer you know 
it, and if that was the problem, then maybe that would be the solution. But um, our research, and of course, the war on drugs would suggest that that isn't the problem, right? As in, it doesn't matter how harsh the punishment is, um, the, there, there's something else that is guiding this behavior. And of course, the with drug seeking, the the reach is for, look, the these substances have completely taken over kind of the the thought process of these individuals, um, that there's way too much excessive reward motivation that is is driving the behavior. Now, one of the things that we're proposing um, that we've got, you know, experimental evidence for now is that one of the things that really that seems to fall through the cracks is that capacity to learn that association between our behavior and those outcomes. This is seen in the animals. This is seen you know, when we do this in humans as well. So that when you give them that punishing scenario and you actually use a task that helps to disentangle those different accounts of what we call punishment insensitivity, right? This persistence of, of detrimental behavior. Um, it These individuals that persist can have completely normal motivation for the reward, right? They're not, they are not more motivated for the reward than their sense punishment sensitive counterparts, nor are they insensitive to the punisher itself, right? As in they care about this negative event, right? So remember we were using that cued, um, cued outcome punishment task or a condition punishment task. And they were responding just as much. They were just as um, afraid, you could say, of that um, cue that predicts the negative event, which tells you they care about that negative event just as much as um, punishment sensitive individuals, where the, the, the real failure point for those insensitive individuals in our experience was, um, was that they just did not change their behavior. And the reason why they did not change their behavior to avoid that negative outcome is because they weren't forming the connection between that behavior and that negative outcome. And the case of um, uh, drug seeking, right? You might say that there's a whole lot of discounting, right? That maybe um, what happens tomorrow is not as cognitively available as what happens um, today, right? So the immediacy of the outcome is part of that. But also, you know, the chance of something negative happening to any individual instance of drug taking can be quite low. The chances that you will be, you know, caught or, you know, that your entire day tomorrow is going to be messed up is not reliable, right? And so you can discount that. You were, we're That's not like your uh, mild introduction on a variable rate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Still maintains the behavior. Um, but uh, in a different way than no punishment at all. But if it's mild, i.e. only get caught once a year, once every three years, yeah. slap on the wrist, whatever, whatever. Yeah. We, so it's no biggie. It's no yeah. biggie. And it's unpre- you can't predict when it will happen. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and oftentimes, so when it comes to gambling and drug seeking, there's a trajectory, right? It doesn't start off as if the very first time that you do all, um, you, you do something. So let's say someone, um, you know, let's take something that's more licit, like alcohol, you know, if the very first time that you drank alcohol, um, you know, you had all the negative consequences associated with the, you know, you know, alcoholism, right? You're, you know, you're terribly sick. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you, you had a bad night and and all that. The chances of you continuing down this path of is, is lower, is, is definitely lower, right? Than if you had a really great experience the first time, and then that kind of slowly morphs into something that's more problematic. Um, I mean, drug seeking, you can't boil these things down too simple, right? Addiction is a complicated, is, is couched in, in a social and, and economic context. Um, and, and the way that we process these things is complicated. But one of the factors that we're showing in, in the lab and even in, you know, in our human population is that when punishment is infrequent, you, one of the ways that you get persistence of this behavior that you know, even in our human subjects, they're like, I really don't like that outcome. And I, you know, and I, I like 
you know, yeah, sure, I like the rewards. In our in our human studies, we're using points, and those are tied to financial rewards. You know, it's like, oh, I like the points. I really dislike how this event is taking points away from me. One of the things that a lot of individuals are failing to do, and this is kind of pointing to this um, really prevalent um, failure in our cognitions, is there we are really bad for some reason at detecting how our actions lead to negative events, right? As in, that's just something that our brain chooses to just not encode for whatever reason. Um, maybe it's to um, to promote kind of, um, you know, just go for it, just, you know, just risk it for the biscuit kind of um, mentality. <laughs> but, and that's kind of, and 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 that's not just human, right? This is almost like uh, we don't want to be overly avoidant. Um, we 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 need to risk risk a little bit, but yeah, for some reason. How do we know that, Phil? What what what's the research that that tells us that we're really bad in connecting how our actions lead to negative outcomes? Yeah, sure. So I mean, I'll um, well, we'll we'll segue to the human um, work. Because yeah, please. It's much more intuitive talking about that. Um, and I'm sure I'm more intuitive to your audience as well. So um, we basically, you know, we can bring, um, you know, participants into the lab. Um, so these are, um, well, we don't, we don't really know whether they're, you know, healthy or unhealthy in any way, whether they've been diagnosed with anything. But, you know, we bring folks into the, um, we, we give them access to this computer game. And we basically say, look, um, there's a game where you, we call it the planet, uh, planets and pirates task. So they've got X, you know, they, they have given this interface where they've got two, uh, planets and we've told them, you know, you can, um, click on these planets, um, to trade with them. And, you know, again, about 50% of the time, if they click on a planet, there's, you know, a little, there's animations and they can do this all in real time. So it's not like, a your traditional tasks where, you know, you make a response, you move on to the next screen, it gives you feedback, and then they, you know, just rinse and repeat a lot of times. This is kind of a real-time game where, you know, animations are happening. And so they can click on these uh, two planets for point rewards. And, you know, we've told them that if you do well in this task, you'll get some bonus, you know, obviously we pay our participants and they'll get um, a sizable bonus if they're one of the top performers. So there's some motivation for them to um, to actually engage in this task. And it's a game. So actually all our participants seem to really like playing it. Um, so we start them off with that where they're just trading away and they you know build up a little bit of a, a they accumulate these points. And later on, we introduce uh, our Q negative outcome continuity. So when they click on one of the planets, a ship, you know, a, a spaceship can appear. And one of these spaceships is associated with a uh, them losing 20% or however many percent of their accumulated points. So, you know, they can be working for minutes, accumulating whatever thousands of points. And then this thing comes along and takes away, you know, you know, let's say they've accumulated 10,000 points um, by the end of the reward stage, this thing comes along and takes away 2,000 of those points just like that um, is, um, you Damn know, researchers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, and you know, uh, if the, so that's that ship that takes away their points is actually associated with one of the planets. Not that we reveal any of this to them, uh, from the outset, uh, whereas clicking on the other planet produces a ship that has no negative consequence associated with it. And so we after each block, right? So they're given three minutes to play, you know, different blocks of this game. They get six blocks overall. Um, and we, after each block, we ask them, you know, how the, how much they like the different elements, how much they like those planets, how much they like the ships, how much they like the different outcomes, right? The the point gain as well as the attacks that steal the points away from them. Um, and we also ask them how they think what, you know, what the causal relationships between those things are, right? It's like, you know, if you, you know, if you clicked on the, how much does this planet, you know, 
how is it related to the reward? How is it related to the ships? How is it related to those different, um, to that eventual attack? And, you know, when we... And do you ask that about specific planets? We ask it for each planet. Oh, for each planet. Okay. okay, Yeah. 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 So we're... um, So I'll, I'll pass you the... All of all of this research is open access, so we can. I'll give you the the link for that. And oh, wonderful! Yeah, if your readers are interested, they can look into it. So, um, at the end of it, you know, we're interested in their behavior. How, how much are they selecting between these planets? The one that's punished, so that we call it R one, and the one that's unpunished, and that's R two. You know, how much are they selecting between those planets? You know, at you know when no ships are happening and um you know if you are learning the relationships or if you're interested yeah if you're learning the relationship between those actions and the uh, ships and the attacks you should be avoiding r1 right that punished response yes Uh, and reallocating your efforts to the unpunished planet and you know just like in our rodents we get a bimodal distribution of um choice behavior right so you've got individuals that are as punishment you know as they're exposed to this punishing scenario they without any prompting are learning to avoid that punished planet as you would would be adaptive right like this is actually the optimal strategy of just don't make that response anymore it's not very good for you um and then you have a um another kind of cluster or rather um as we'll reveal later, two clusters of individuals that are punishment insensitive in that they still, they maintain their responses on both planets, right? They're clicking R1 at the same rate as they're clicking R2. They're showing no bias or avoidance at all. And if you look at their- uh, Throughout six blocks, throughout all six blocks. Well, so they get two blocks of no punishment and then um, this is with three blocks of punishment. So by the end of three blocks of punishment, they've had almost 10 minutes of this task, right? And the percentage, the percentages, the default percentage is 20%. So one fifth of their responses. And I should say they're clicking about 20 times per planet per minute. So they're like really, you know, going at this task. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. getting there's five planets, therefore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh well, there's two planets actually. So oh, only the two. My apologies. My apologies. Yeah, yes. there's only yeah. two planets for them to click on. So they're 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 um they're getting plenty of opportunity to learn this association. And again, you know, we're getting this bimodal distribution of those that avoid versus those that don't avoid. And it's interesting that they it's just an abject failure of avoidance, right? And that's what's driving that bimodal distribution. It's not like um, yeah, maybe I'll do a little bit of that. It's really complete continuation and uh what we're interested in of course is well what is predicting this um failure to avoid and when you look at those valuations those individuals are valuing the reward like they report liking the reward at a similar level to those that you know the punishment sensitive individuals that when you ask them how much they dislike the attack they dislike the attack at a similar level right as in pretty equivalently to those that um, are sensitive so there's no uh, evidence for them valuing the outcomes themselves differently um and you know when you look at how much they're learning about the cues right those ships that lead to attack versus the ship that doesn't lead to attack both groups right sensitive versus insensitive they are learning that the, you know, the CS plus, we should say, that um, that attacking or hostile ship, they know that's the bad one. They report disliking it and they can report the, they can causally infer that that ship leads to attack, whereas the other ship doesn't. And they, they kind of like that ship, right? It's like a safe ship. Sure. Now, where the where the clusters really differ is how they value those two actions, right? So the sensitive individuals really d- report disliking punished R1, whereas they like the unpunished R2. Uh, it's so much easier if I had the figures to show you. No, no, no. I'm, I'm following. I'm following. Um, and um, whereas the insensitive individuals 
were basically valuing them equally, right? So they weren't able to, you know, revalue those actions. And that was predicted by um, their ability to link each response, right? To causally infer that this action led to that yeah. cue, right? So it's the exact same, it's actually the exact same diagnosis for what's happening uh, when we did this in the animal um, in, in our rodent study. So, but here we are literally asking our participants what leads to what, and those insensitive individuals didn't have a clue how their behavior led to particular shifts, even though there was a one-to-one -one relationship. It wasn't <laughs> like, oh, 80% of the time it led to one ship, 20% of the time it led to the other one. No, nope, it was this R1 only led to the hostile ship. R2 only led to the neutral ship. And that was something that they couldn't piece together. And so, you know, that's something that we think, you know, clearly this is that action to negative consequence, that particular association just does not, you know, it individuals seem to be pretty bad at doing that. And we've, mm -hmm. you know, we've- Can I ask Phil? Yeah, sure. Because um, this is really important for, for, for I think, the, the, um, for what you just said. Out of 100 participants, or if you can kind of bring it down, mm -hmm. I would have to assume, um, uh, guess that uh, the vast majority would be sensitive. It would be in the sensitive um, one, and the smaller version would have to be in the insensitive. And my logic in there says most people don't go out and use illicit drugs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, having said that, I suppose I also gave an example of uh, I do go out and eat chips on the, you know, in front of Netflix. Uh, yeah. So I'm probably in the insensitive uh, 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 pile as well. But what is the numbers? Like what, yeah. what, what, what's the distributions? Well, I mean, of course, this is going to be, you know, a function of time and, and the particular, you know, we, we can, we can shift those numbers around. So we've done follow-up experiments where we're, asking you know what environmental factors what kind of factors um can help a person be sensitive versus drive them towards that sure. insensitive cluster and there are one of the factors of course is how the probabilities of an action yielding punishment sure um and we'll get into that later because there's some interesting findings in there but um actually it is not what you think the majority of participants are insensitive. Oh my God. Um, yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> then we can shift participants between those two different, um, you know, we call them behavioral phenotypes. But yeah, we can shift people between sensitivity and insensitivity depending on the circumstances. Um, but yeah, it is... It's this is, it is hurting not my what brain. you think. It is not... These are not outlier individuals. They yeah, are, yeah, it's hurting my brain. Yeah. yeah. And and I mean, I think that we overestimate, we totally overestimate how good we are at learning from our experience, put it that way. We can experience things and learn complete, you know, like we, we can learn nothing on one end and we can also learn the complete wrong things, right? As in uh, there, there's, there's a bit of a crapshoot <laughs> when it comes to, um, you know, how we process our environment. And that's probably why so many of us um, need the information, you know, it's, that's why we need to be, you know, educated, whether that's through like public safety announcements and, um, or or through, you know, talk therapy, right? We, we, it, we don't naturally come to the right conclusion on our own a lot of the time. Um, that's one of the kind of takeaways from this. And, you know, I feel very I secure in my job. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll be fine. Uh, and, and, but, and, but not, not in my own confidence for myself about making the right decisions. <laughs> well, I will say that there is hope, right? As in, so we, we can be quite hopeless, but at the same time, um, so one of the things, you know, a natural follow up question that we had with this idea that, okay, um, a lot of individuals are not on their own, you know, unassisted, detecting how their behavior leads to a negative consequence, right? And that's why they will continue doing something that is 
something yeah. that they will say, you know, they will walk right into an outcome that they would they report wanting to avoid. So, um, you know, we said, well, what if we just told our participants how their actions lead to particular outcomes, right? So we, after giving them three blocks of that punishment to give them a chance to figure it out on their own, we reveal to the participants, R1 leads to, hostile ship leads to um, the attack, whereas R2 leads to the friendly ship. And what we find is that the majority of the participants, not all of them, and this is where you know, and this is where we start getting into the interesting thing, uh, like the really interesting, uh, you know, heart of the cookie is that the majority of participants immediately change their behavior, right? They immediately start like completely avoiding R1 and reallocating their behavior to R2. It's it's drastic. Um, and, you sure. know, we, we do a lot of data-driven analysis to try, you know, really, we don't want to force our hypothesis onto this we let the data speak for itself um and we tend to use like objective sure. methods of, of 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 identifying sensitive versus insensitive versus you know whatever other um phenotypes and, we find in and, the data and that's when you're looking at it from a data perspective the, the narrative might be something like that's the argument for uh strong social bonds being the moderator that they can mm. go out and say, hey, watch out because yeah. of this, and they learn. Exactly. Um, that's kind of like the Rat Park, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah. The Rat Park, which has been so publicized. Um, that's where that potentially um, uh, demonstrates that there, there would be a social component, which um, I'm assuming rats could also say, hey, don't do that, come play with us, um, or don't do that, yeah. you're just desirable to you know, the, 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 the females over here or whatever it might be, um, that makes it, makes yeah. it interesting. I'm, I mean, Rat Park is, you know, there, there's all sorts of things that can be going on in Rat Park and sure. <laughs> I mean, not I mean rats, people. rats are incredibly social creatures. And so they do, there is observational learning and there's social, uh, learning as well, right. As in that they communicate things, they, they teach yeah. each other things. Um, yeah, but, but sorry, sorry. Phil. T tell me about the the, the individuals that uh, just yeah. persist uh, even after even after you oh. tell them. <laughs> yeah, they're the they're, risk takers. They're well, you know, the for adventurers. Lack of, for lack of a better, you know, term, we call we we refer to them as um, compulsives. Um, <clears throat> so so with this compulsive subset that maintains their behavior even after they've been told how the behavior leads to. Um, that negative outcome. And we're still piecing that story together. We, we keep, you know, prodding at that group. Um, and, and this, and, and we're actually, you know, this paper was only published um, last year, the one where we revealed um, contingency, we identified this compulsive subset. But there, um, you know, we've done some follow-up experiments unpublished, and they think they think that what they're doing is optimal, which it isn't because, you know, we can look at their point gain. And we have, you know, if you're asking why do they, how do they come to that conclusion? I would say that this group is, it's, they're, they're varied. There's a lot of reasons why someone might come to the conclusion that their behavior is optimal, even when it isn't. Um, and, one of the things that actually drives an individual into that particular group is when punishment is infrequent, right? So when it's inconsistent. So consistency, of course, if you increase the, and I should say this is independent of how severe the punishment is, right? So that's another thing that we've kind of controlled wow. for. Yeah, is that makes sense. Yeah, so, uh, and and this is kind of one of the take-home messages. It was kind of one of the application points, I think, for, um, you know, this is all you know, interesting from a theoretical perspective, but from a actionable item point, um, we are showing that the intensity of a punishment is less important than the consistency of punishment for actually encouraging behavior. And that, you know, from a societal government perspective, right? So imagine if you, every time you sped, you got a fine instead of, you know, every now and then, and you will see that, you know, speed cameras will get you every time. And if you're, 
ever caught in, you know, if you're driving along Parramatta Road or whatever, the points at which drivers will reliably slow down and obey the speed limit is when there's a speed camera coming up, right? And that's tied to the consistency of yes. that, that punishment, the, the speeding fine. Um, it's when that thing becomes inconsistent, right? Like, oh, it's just a, a, a policeman on the side of the road and he's there, you know, one in one in 10 days, that's where you're um, you're not going to get a reliable reduction. Mm. Even and, though people and we know do all that. sorts of we do all sorts of calculations. Like I went past on the highway at a uh, at ten kilometers over, and I didn't get pulled over. Yeah. So leniency. So now I'm starting to versus a camera says no snap every time. No, yeah. that we're just going to snap snap. There's no um, disputing or, or, or questioning yeah. that. So. Um, it's interesting, though. Of course, I love ev you know, evolutionary theory, and obviously mm. looking at the the um, spectrum of of different um, behaviors. Maybe the compulsives, so 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 to speak, mm. um, uh, you know, and them thinking it's optimal is kind of those ground breakers obviously yeah. there's a higher risk though as well but but they're the ones that will advent adventure further you know mm -hmm. you know the no one should go beyond this line because you will perish yeah but some will jump in their boat and 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 and, and go and yeah many will perish um but some are uh, are then rewarded um immensely there's a jackpot yeah at, at the end and so maybe the experimenters are uh, uh, uh what they're saying is garbage you know um i don't yeah. believe them or yeah. uh you know you've got to go against the system um yes w whatever it might be that there's obviously a different appraisal yeah. going on because you're even being told this is how it works but it's like mm, i'm not i'm I'm, yeah. I'm i'm still not necessarily trusting that or believing that yeah. or i still want to i still want to check for myself yeah. I, I want to know myself not to be told i need yeah. I, I I need to see for myself. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's definitely a bit of that going on uh, for sure. So that's where we we can really get into the weeds. And, and some of it's in the paper. Of course, some of this work is unpublished. But um, you what's know, the paper? Just ju just for. Uh, oh, sure. Who, um, so um, I think it's called uh, Cognitive Pathways to punishment and sensitivity off the top of my head i should really uh, know the title of my own paper. oh no that's fine uh, sure but it's it's it. um <clears throat> yeah if you search up cognitive pathways um to punishment and sensitivity it'll definitely show up and it's in um pnas so proceedings of the national academy of sciences um and that's where we kind of unpack the or identify and start to try and uh pick apart the psychology of those that will pr just can't figure it out on their own, but will change their behavior uh, once you tell them. And we call those, we call that cluster unaware, right? Because that was the only issue. Whereas the ones that will persist, we call them compulsive. Um, and in terms of uh, kind of speaking to that point that you raised of them going, uh, they're the risk takers, they're the revolutionaries. Um, there's a bit of that. So this is where I say, I think there, there are different types of individuals within that compulsive cluster some of them just don't believe what we're saying right they're distrusting yeah. um but there are definitely some that trusted what we say and of course there's they from their own experience corroborating evidence for what we're saying we did not provide we have not tested giving false information um we just gave accurate beneficial information and some of them took that information on board but their behavior change was quite um subtle right as in they they maybe they adjusted their behavior slightly but not completely and you could maybe chalk this up to um what we call like an explore exploit trade-off right so it's like on one hand sure. you can know something but you still want to keep trying the other option just in case right like let's let's keep doing this suboptimal thing to not fall into a behavioral trap, right? And this is true for a lot of um, disorders, like as in you might never know when that response, which is rewarding, is safe again. So they're still trying that other response out and you know 
just just in case conditions change for the better, right? So they're, uh, in a sense, this is kind of a, a type of opportunism. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, follow up experiment really would be interesting. So my apologies for my, yeah. a follow up experiment would be, which would be interesting in my mind, would be as you say, give uh, uh, give false information and say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've rigged we've rigged it. The more times you um, strike on the the, the ship slash planet that that gives you a punishment there is you know a golden pot at the end and you know you haven't mm. been hitting it enough um yeah so you know you need to uh, uh, uh exploit this knowledge um and and, go, and then see whether the compulsive still go now i'm actually going to revert to the other side um yeah i'm going to check the other one i mean that would be fascinating yeah. uh I mean, look. Oh, there's sure. a lot of there's everything's a lot of, fascinating, right? <laughs> there's there's a lot of questions that we have, and we want to we want to continue doing this work. We want to keep doubling down on on this particular line of research, um, and so, and a lot of other people have have shown a lot of interest in it um, because it is so counterintuitive. This is um, revolutionary yeah. in my mind. It, 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 it's uh, spectacular because it, it it is so against what we would expect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and that potentially goes out and says, okay, so that's the population that mm -hmm. uh, despite our best, um, uh, you know, government, government initiatives around education and the like, they repeatedly um, find themselves in, 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 in difficult situations of, of you yeah. know, repeating behaviours that create negative yeah. outcomes for them. Yeah. It, it, and, of course, there's all the, the other contexts for particular behaviors, right? But the, the thing that we're pushing, and this is what, you know, is counterintuitive to people who are like evolutionary psychologists and say, look, we've got these hardwired um, mechanisms for learning, right? As in our experiences kind of deliver or, or form, I mean, semi-accurate beliefs and, you know, what we're finding and what we're saying is that's, no, it's a bit more, it's, beliefs are, are, are fundamental, they're really important. And indeed the beliefs that we form through our experiences guide our decision-making, guide our behavior. But, you know, our beliefs aren't, you know, there isn't a, a necessarily a strong correspondence between our experiences and our beliefs, right? We can form beliefs that are just, um, that deviate, right? And, and don't correspond to reality. Um, and that's where, you know, for a lot of people, um, all they need is a little bit of um, good advice, right? <laughs> and, and a little bit of, um, you know, basically a little bit extra information, some explicit information to help them form accurate beliefs. And then and there's the rest of um, individuals that might need a little something else. And so that's another thing that we're trying to look sure. into is like, how do we... Um, you know, given that this is problematic, we're not in the business of misleading people. And of course, conspiracy theories is is the problem of our time, right? Um, you know, so how do we how do we deprogram or how do we how do we fix these obstinate, inaccurate beliefs mm. so that people can start making again, we're not trying to necessarily force people to behave in ways that they don't agree with sure we want people to behave in ways that are consistent with their own what you your own goals your own this is what you want this is what you value but your behavior is not actually reaching you know it's not actually achieving those things because you've formed in a sense your worldview your the your elaborated belief structure is not actually accurately representing the world and how you and your behavior fits into that, like how your behavior has these consequences. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's all about trying to help, you know, it's like, how do we help people form more accurate beliefs so that they can um, kind of live their best lives, if you will. What's interesting is uh, not that I think that uh, CBT is not uh, effective, but being an ACT therapist, um, mm. I see at least for myself personally, um, uh, uh, some some um, additional advantages. I see that with the introduction of evidence or information, CBT often relieves the limbic system. It reduces that, and then therefore people can decide on you know uh, an optimal um, decision. 
where acts become as i think uh, uh even more um valuable in certain situations is that when you provide information uh people uh, people are usually quite intelligent and they already know the cbt response they can already put together the the evidence mm -hmm. and so act comes into play when the evidence does not relieve the limbic response right um and so it, it accepts that the person has a over aroused limbic system in that queue um, and makes space for it to continue to do something functional. So hmm. uh, I would say I'm fairly reasonably logical, but when I jump in an aeroplane, my limbic system is out of control. Right. Um, uh, and I, I don't have a story to that, um, but it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do I get myself onto a plane is I accept that I have an aroused limbic system. Uh, I'm right. not actually trying to stop the limbic system. Yeah. Part of what I think is the problem with exposure therapy is that it's on the premise of the limbic system will eventually uh, uh, come down. And that's yeah. not uh, objective for everybody. As a matter mm. of fact, that's why people come to therapy uh, because it's not always going to work out that way. And so exposure right. doesn't always work. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be a first line of defense. Absolutely it should, because it works for most things. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, I think that's, that it's can't a tool in a toolbox. Yeah. Uh, but when that doesn't work, uh, I think ACT has a, a fantastic approach of, you know, making space for that. And hence why, um, you know, that, 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 that's so much of my, 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 my passion. Mm. Um, I'm just mindful of, of of time, Phil. I've taken so much uh, of it. I could talk to you pleasure. for for um, years. Um, I, I wish we could just chat and then get up in the morning and talk again, uh -huh. and, and 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 repeat. There's, there's so much to to talk about. Uh, for those who are listening, uh, where would you? Um, uh, uh, point them in, in in the direction of continuing on with 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 this topic. Um, who are some of the interesting players? Where can they find your work? Um, uh, you know, how can they even get involved in this space? L let's say for you know for students who are um, you know considering going into into research. Mm. Um, so I mean, I'm I'm kind of just starting out as a as a kind of a academic researcher. Um, though I've been in research for quite a while now. Um, but, you know, you, people can find me on the UNSW website. Um, and I'm, I'm, I guess, on Twitter if people want to get in contact as well. Or I tend to update what, what we're up to um, in the lab there. Of course, for this the research topics that we've been talking about, there's um, the PNAS paper, um, which I'll send you a link for. And um, there's a lot of players, I get, well, there's, there's various different people working on different things in this space. Um, I'm, as a person who comes from a more behavioral neuroscience background, I'm more familiar with the work that's being done in that space. But there's, um, you know, depending on, because we covered so many different topics today, um, <laughs> you know, if, if people are interested in particular things, I'm happy to, you know, if they want to get in touch and um, want me to point them in particular directions, I can do that. Otherwise, I'll spend another half an hour just talking about different researchers and what they're up to. Yeah, but yeah, there's it's it's a really exciting time to be um, both uh, you know a experimental psychologist as well as a behavioral neuroscientist. It's um, there's there's so much exciting work that's happening. Yeah. Look, I, I uh, although I'm not obviously in that field, it sounds like it's an incredibly um, fascinating time to be involved and and i think the applications are phenomenal you know to mm -hmm. to be able to even you know in the short time that we've uh, spoken to to understand what the data is is saying and even just the patterns that we can see these scenarios where uh, you know going back to the world you know the the compulsive those that that continue to repeat a behavior despite being told Yes, we can see evolutionary perspective, but it also says something about how we do, uh, uh, how we do society. You know yeah. what expectations we can play, how we should treat these people. We understand that 
um, you know, increasing the punishment does not assist. Uh, you know, mm. let's not go back to the world of cutting people's hands off or yeah, stealing. No. Um, thankfully, obviously, at least in Australia, we're not there uh, yeah. anymore, yeah. or I'm not sure if we ever were, but nonetheless, yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a lot to be said, and and for me, what's interesting, and I'm sure the same is for you. Uh, research for the sake of research is not interesting mm -hmm. research for the sake of being absolutely blown away and fascinated by what the data surprises us with and then mm -hmm. applied in mm -hmm. is is everything and, and and i hope that you know this conversation and the podcast you know does go out and and um allow others uh, not only myself to learn immensely uh, but then to consider about you know, how does uh, uh how does the you know, uh, punishment learning operate, uh, uh, and you know where is technology at? Let's be inspired to 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 try and learn from this space and and be more involved. Mm -hmm. and I just hope you know you guys get more funding, and not only funding to do research, but yeah. funding to distribute the knowledge that that is being gained, because that is a big yeah. part of of you know. I wish our policymakers and 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 the like. You know, people who are very learned, but uh, I wish they could be involved in this conversation mm. as well because yeah. they would want to pick your brain even more to say, you know, uh, is what we're doing optimal? Is the data showing this? What could we expect? And you'd still run pilot programs, but uh, mm. uh, uh, because you're still going to see how it lands, there's less, uh, there's more variables, less the controls. Process. But it uh, starts with basic research, right? Yeah, but we've got to go back to research. We've got to go back to science. So, um Phil, I can't thank you uh, enough uh, for for your uh, for your work and for for sharing today, being so so generous. Um, for having me, and yeah, look, I appreciate you and your colleagues. It, it's a fascinating time to be alive, and mm. and uh, yeah, I wish you all the best with, with many more years of research because we need people like you on the ground. Thank you very much, Nash. It's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.